Hi everyone, I'm Emily. Okay. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm a, mainly a sculptor, uh, but I also I have a studio here in Melbourne uh, where I make large-scale exhibitions that map out uh, different theories and ideas into the, the space of the museum. Uh, but I also work a lot with uh, printmaking and also relational projects. And I wanted to speak to you today in this kind of context of the design department about um, the, the kind of relationship I have with historical documentation and uh, the arrangement of ideas on the page and graphic information. Uh, and to start with a project that I finished last year for the, for the university, um, I was approached by the curator of MAMA here at uh, Monash to, to make a public sculpture for, for the university. Um, and my first kind of thinking uh, was to think about the space where the sculpture would be installed, but I also really wanted to focus on the, the history of student politics at Monash University, um, because it's very, very rich, very rich history. Uh, so, here's an image of the the uh, Menzies building at at Clayton, and during the 60s and the 70s. Monash University really became the epicentre of student politics um, in Australia. And this is an image uh, when Malcolm Fraser visited um, the Monash campus in Clayton uh, during, during the 70s. And it became known in political history as the Monash siege. Um, Fraser was uh, surrounded by hundreds of students and was, was unable to, um, to get out of this, this crowd and uh, fled, fled back to his car. Amazing time. If you think about the kind of relationship we have to politics on campus now, a very, very interesting time. Um, and in my thinking, I, was, I really do believe that uh, the idea of a kind of political life on campus is not something completely of the past. I find um, with my students here at Monash that they have a lot to say. They are very kind of, they're very different concerns to those days. Um, but one, one thing that I found when I spoke to people from the old days at Monash was uh, they really admired some of the actions that uh, international students have, have done to find a political voice. This was a recent uh, protest by Indian students outside Flinders Street Station. Um, I'm very influenced in my work by my, um, by my background, my family background. My uh, mum was an activist in the community movement uh, during the 70s and 80s in Australia and also in the feminist movement. Uh, and she was part of a movement of women who uh, put together this thing called the community childcare movement. And the idea was that women could move out into the public sphere if, uh, they had, if there was a kind of organisational way of looking after children. Um, and these, these things that they organised often had a very strong socialist principles and a relationship back to uh, the Marxist and communist parties of Australia, uh, similar to what happened at Monash, where there was a very strong influence coming from these kind of left-wing uh, forces. And one of the things that I really remember from that time was uh, these adventure playgrounds, which were run very much along kind of socialist principles that children would come together into a communal space um, and it was about self-organisation. So if you put all the kids together, they would work out a kind of revolutionary space. So these are the kind of structures that I began to look at when I was working on that project. 
And this is an adventure playground which still exists uh, in Fitzroy. It's called the Cubbies Playground and it's below the Atherton Gardens uh, estate. And this sort of interest in a kind of adventure playground, I do see the spaces that we work in as artists and designers as this kind of similar um, adventure space, this communal space where we can play and experiment. And so I was interested in this idea of the kind of structures you would find in those playgrounds and how they could be um, installed into this uh, space at Monash. So this is the, the structure that I designed and made out of steel. And then into the uh, spaces of the, of the sculpture, the work, here's some people at the Richard Bell opening. I, um, I started this idea of how the spaces could be filled with an outdoor library of left-wing material that related to the, the history of Monash and the student movement. So um, I found books. There's this fantastic um, book sale at Trades Hall every year called the Big Red Book Sale. And this is where um, big archives of political books and ephemera are on sale. So I bought a whole heap of these books. Uh, and then I also came across a huge archive of uh, printed ephemera from that period. Uh, and I found it actually by Googling the, the history of um, the Monash Labour Club and the movement. And I found online uh, a kind of annotated, very small selection of archive materials that had been put online by this guy, Ken Mansell, uh, and I had this feeling that it may be the kind of tip of an iceberg that there could that Ken may potentially have an archive of this material. And so I contacted him uh, through an artist friend, found out where he lived, uh, and he very generously, he did have a very expansive archive of this material, and he very generously allowed for it to be reproduced for this project. So what we did was we went to his uh, house, went through the filing cabinets that he has, we photographed the material and then copied it and placed it inside the sculpture and then also on display um, in the museum. Um, and because I had this awareness that contemporary students do have a very strong kind of political uh, knowledge and affirmation, even though it may be very different from those times, uh, I had this idea that we could work at the university to reprint and retranslate this material. So currently we have a group of students who are looking at this material and uh, reimagining it in the, the present tense and in terms of their own experience as students. Um, so I'll just take you through some of the material. Some of it's quite funny. This is actually an ASIO document and it was prepared by ASIO to show the different, all the different student groups. And so you might think that they were not very powerful, just a bunch of kind of crazy, uh, disorganised stud students, but ASIO actually uh, spied on them and worked out a, this kind of di diagram that shows all the relationships between these different groups. So you can see uh, it, near the centre there's the bakery, which was where um, the, the students, all, that was their campaign headquarters at Monash, and then relationships back to Moscow and to the Communist Party. So it's actually a really beautiful diagram. Uh, and also in, in the corner you can see students in descent, and these are actually high school students that were organised around Melbourne at this time during the late 60s. Um, and it shows the different pamphlets that they produced. So they obviously felt that this was a really strong political threat. Uh, and this is a balance sheet of expenditure from the Monash Labor Club. Um, I think it's really interesting in terms of the, the idea that there was actually a really strong funding um, uh, funding stream for these organisations. So they actually had access to the student fees 
And so when, we, when we're on campus now, we see these kind of uh, things organised by Gatorade or uh, these kind of energy drinks. In those days, they didn't need to seek so much private uh, sponsorship. And so student organisations had their own kind of funding and their own power. And this is a... This would never happen now. It may happen one day, but who knows? And these, this material uh, shows the relationship that that group of students had to the struggles that were occurring in uh, France during the late 60s, the, the Paris riots. And so this is a reproduced uh, poster from, from that struggle, which the Labor Club people um, reproduced. It's another one. This is a Sydney magazine. And this, uh, this is a great, really strong polemic uh, poster by, put together by Jill Jaleef, who went on to become an investigative journalist. She was uh, part of the Monash Labor Club um, and was also uh, part of the circle that was around the bakery. And it's a really interesting piece of writing, very vehement, very polemical in its feminism and its, um, its critique of the, the poverty in Pran at the time that she saw living there um, and also the, the urban renewal that she saw going on. So the, the kind of divide between rich and poor that, um, that was going on there. And the Monash Labor Club had a uh, a kind of theoretical publication that they called Analysis. Uh, and these have really beautiful covers, absolutely lovely kind of arrangement of text on the page for these ones. This has a great relationship to uh, letterism, to the, the movement uh, that began in Europe after the Second War, World War, of this idea of the arrangement for, of forms and graphics on the page. And this is also another cover from Analysis. So in these, in these publications, uh, the Labor Club really set out a very strong socialist Marxist agenda for how students uh, can change society. So they're very polemical, uh, very, quite dense, and they're, they're available in the library as well. So they're, they're really interesting um, to read, but one of the things they really were fighting against was the idea that you go to uni and you are trained to become a professional, that it's a kind of factory for uh, a kind of you becoming a kind of part of this industrialised society. So they were very kind of uh, very focused in, in their critique. Um, and at this time, during the late 60s, the, the Labour Club began to publish every day. So they had this, uh, this publication that they put out called Print. It was kind of a newsletter or an information paper. Um, and I think there's lots of different examples of the way that the left kind of prefigure the internet. Um, and this is really one of them, where this idea of publishing something every day as history unfolds uh, and it's quite similar to the, the idea of emailing, in a way, uh, or the idea of a blog, so that history is unfolding so fast that you need this daily publication. And what really struck me reading this material was how, uh, how confident it is in its polemical style of writing as well. And this one's got a really beautiful kind of two-colour uh, print as well and it was really interesting to hear from the activists the way that they uh, that the technology of printing really helped to uh, them to become a really powerful student organisation so they used Roneos or primitive uh, uh, photocopiers and th this allowed them to circulate everything really quickly on campus so it's an example of the history and the technology and the organisation coming together at this, the one time. And that one's got a lovely 
kind of concrete poetry. Uh, and amongst this archive also is, uh, is this material that comes from these high school students. So around 1968-69, uh, these students from Melbourne High, um, Mentone Girls, all these different schools, about 12 different schools, they start um, publishing these very kind of raw socialist uh, documents which are very critical of authority, very critical of the schools and the way they uh, are structured. And they were supported by the Monash Labor Club, but they're a genuine sort of example of um, invention. They, the ideas came purely from the students. And I was really... They really struck me, this idea that we don't think of people who are 15 or 16 as being political, but there was this very strong... Uh, agenda that was running out of these high schools and the Labor Club helped them to print their documents um, and the graphics are fantastic as well so they were students in descent and then they became they changed their anagrams as they went on they became uh, secondary students of uh, Australia as well I really like this one. It's got a great sort of pie document, pie graphic there. Why should you be a socialist? This is a pamphlet that came out of Elwood High in 1970. And um, this, because that time also was the time of the Vietnam War, so a lot of the documents that I found from Ken uh, also have a very anti-conscription kind of feel. Uh, those movements were unfolding at the same time. And uh, I, this is a fantastic example of Australian graphic design. It's kind of... It's about how not to join the army. It's anti-conscription. But it's got this kind of May Gibbs kind of gumnut... Aesthetic, which I think is really, really interesting. And so the, the document goes through all these th different things that you can do to avoid being conscripted into the army. So there's be gay, be militant, uh, kind of practical information, like you can be a political objector, you can be a conscientious objector, uh, act simple, go bush, so run away drink and this uh, this document I think is really interesting as a kind of concrete poem which has a very strong obviously very strong Marxist uh, feel of the, the hammer and sickle and again I think it's that very simple two colour that uh, really works in these documents and many of these documents also were quite personal to the person who held the, the uh, archive as, as well. So this was a, an application form for a seminar that Ken had filled out as well. Um, so, yeah, so that is that um, project. And I wanted to also to put it in, into context with my work um, this is a, an early uh, piece that I did. It's called Marxism for, for Beginners. So really kind of th think, thinking in my practice about different ways to, uh, to think about these utopias. So this shows um, the four stages of a Marxist revolution. So you have the, uh, the worship of false idols at the top, uh, then the monopoly of the means of production. So you have one rabbit has all the carrots and then the other rabbits have to eat their poo. And then you have the revolutionary phase where um, the, carrot, the smaller rabbits get the carrots back and then the uh, redistribution of wealth. So it shows a kind of interest in uh, showing these different political polemics Uh, and I've also been very interested in educational philosophies from 
those uh, from childhood through to uh, adult universities. So very influenced by alternative education uh, and uh, the philosophies of Rudolf Steiner. Uh, and Steiner had an idea about laying out text and ideas into physical space as a kind of spatial learning. And so these uh, works lay out different ideas into the space of the gallery. And these are based on uh, different texts. This work is called uh, Strategy to Infiltrate the Homes of the Bourgeoisie. Um, and it was a kind of time for me where I was interested in, again, this idea of laying out text and the gallery becoming a kind of a, a, a page space for the laying out of ideas. But I was also very interested at this point in uh, what is the function of art and what happens to a work of art. So this idea of an artwork ending up into a kind of bourgeois space was something that... Uh, was uh, something for me to think about at this time. Uh, and this work is called uh, Permaculture Crossed with Feminist Science Fiction. So I became interested in the idea of ideas coming together, so more than one polemical idea. Uh, and I, it was made for an exhibition called Optimism, uh, and I focused on this idea of two optimistic uh, ideas and, and how they might come together to form new meaning. So I looked at graphic material from permaculture and then uh, placed it together with feminist science fiction. And this work looked at feminist polemic from the 1970s. So from um, the, uh, the book, The Female Eunuch, which I don't know, probably most of you have seen the book by Germaine Greer. So it has this fantastic uh, cover with a, a kind of dis disembodied figure. So I took this, this figure and reproduced it as a symbolic image and then surrounded it with text from that novel. Oops. Uh, and these works are called Modern Ladies and Steiner Rainbow. And this work is an open space. So I became very interested in this idea that you can inhabit language and it, that it can be a place that you move through and pass through. And these are works where I uh, tried to remember all the French that I learned from high school. And 2001, the Stanley Kubrick film. And these works have existed on in different scale as well. This work was for the East Link motorway. Um, thinking about this idea of what might be the, the new utopia. I have often kind of come across things, turn them around and try and work out how can they be applicable, how will they work in terms of uh, the left and its utopias. And I think that from uh, those kind of early gestures in the 60s and 70s, the way that they have really translated is into these utopias that we have around the internet. So ideas of open source, um, software, free software, all these kind of um, ideas that the internet is going to be a free and open space is really where those ideas kind of ended up. Um, and so I became interested in kind of making these objects that... Uh, all have these kind of 
URL addresses of radical websites on them and kind of making these open play forms. And each, so each block has a kind of materialization of, of that utopian space that we are inhabiting. So all of these blocks also have... I looked for many, many months at these different kind of sites and recorded this particular research and then made these objects as a way of kind of materialising this, this uh, immaterial space that we are, we are in now. And then I, I combined them with these um, fruits and different objects. I was thinking about this idea of a kind of common marketplace, this utopian space of collective sharing <clears throat> and consumption. Um, and this, this is a work I finished recently called Workshop. And here I was sort of trying to extend and have this idea that the text and the objects could become a habitable space, an architectural space. And I was really interested in the, um, the Bauhaus toy makers and uh, block makers. And it was a kind of a, a really interesting utopia that uh, was generated by women and children and a very interesting uh, contribution to modernity from women and children. Uh, and these very simple block forms uh, were a way of kind of expressing an ideology. And so I made this, this text work and then combined it with an old document that I had reprinted, um, which uh, is the work, a, a pamphlet for a, a workshop in Sydney during the 1980s that I went to. It's a very different um, stage in Australian political history from those kind of Monash days, a very structured uh, period where there is a very clear political agenda. It doesn't have that very immediate unfolding of knowledge that you find uh, in that Monash period. It's more about building blocks than a sense of provisional space. Uh, so I reproduced this document at the Big Fag Press, which is a fantastic press in Sydney. It's a kind of uh, community of artists that have uh, kind of centred their work around a press that they bought for um, $50. And it's a, an old, redundant lithographic press. Uh, this work's called New Ways of Thinking. Uh, and this is a children's project that I did at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's envisaged as a way of applying that early left-wing uh, knowledge. Um, the idea of children's projects is something that every left-wing utopian movement has engaged with. And I think the reason for that is that this idea that there is a kind of utopian future, that there is a, a place that we can project uh, into the future and build a different world. So uh, I built... I made this kind of utopian space that children could come into and... Uh, experience the, an artwork as an open-ended uh, pl space of play. And in the uh, space, I made this utopian diagram, which it's based on the Bauhaus diagram, uh, which lays out an agenda of learning uh, but every activity which is proposed here is a kind of contemporary manifestation of uh, utopian thinking. 
And these are some uh, printing projects that I've done. Again, trying to consider what might be the new utopia, what might be a new path. And so these, uh, these works all relate to a kind of idea of communal or um, so in some way a kind of socialist idea of, of living. And the orange figure, uh, the text says Hearn Hut Commune, which was Australia's first commune. And there's an engraving of that, that commune. Uh, the penguin says Linux for beginners, which Linux, of course, is the uh, free software that we can use to run uh, our computers, and the mascot for Linux is a penguin. So I combined that idea and that image with um, a sculptural monument from Yugoslavia called the... Uh, there are a group of monuments called the Partisan Monuments, and the uh, orange, sorry, the yellow figure, the text says social insects. So I was interested in this idea of insects as a model for communal living. Um, and here I'll say I get to a point where I feel that it's important to kind of break down the lettering so that the work is less didactic. Uh, the green image is, uh, the text says, mobility and control among nomadic shepherds. And I became really interested in the uh, social organisation of uh, shepherds in Rajasthan uh, and how they have this way of um, decentralising their, um, their power base so that the resources that they generate can be shared equally. Um, and the blue uh, poster says a human scale. And I also became interested in the, social, the communist uh, uh, political organisation in the state of Kerala in India. It's often, Kerala is often seen... Um, by contemporary left-wing thinkers as a new utopia because there was a complete disaster in Eastern Europe. Uh, people often say, oh, it's all right because we've got this amazing society in Kerala where there's free education. So it is a kind of a, a, utop a contemporary utopia. Uh, and the yellow work says abstract solar. And these are works based on uh, permaculture concepts. It says the problem is the solution. And this is an early uh, text from... Uh, it's actually an Australian book called All That False Instruction. Um, and I was asked recently to respond to a publication called Lip Magazine, which uh, was came out during the, I think, the late 70s and the 80s in Australia. It's a really fantastic feminist publication done by a group of women artists. It's got really amazing uh, graphics. Um, and I chose to respond to this work that I, I found in the magazine. It was called The Women's Art Game uh, by Isabel Davies. And it kind of outlines all the difficult struggles that women artists go through uh, in the kind of uh, graphic of a monopoly game. It's a really fantastic uh, piece, of, piece of graphic work. And Lip Magazine is really starting to be uh, reconsidered at this time, so it's very good to see. Um, and just to, just to finish... These are uh, a group of posters or a, a kind of uh, a printing project that is in development at the moment. So I'm looking at some of the material that I grew up with. Um, this is a magazine that my mum 
uh, was the editor of called Ripple. And the front uh, <coughs> covers were designed by Mary Featherston. And so I'm working with uh, one of the lecturers here, Trent Walter, to, uh, to kind of reimagine and reprint these, these covers. They're very interesting um, example of the way that ideas can be laid out on a page. This, I th think this image is really interesting in terms of its kind of formal arrangement of parts. Uh, and these posters are, uh, advertise the kind of children's projects that have influenced the contemporary uh, children's projects that I've put together. So this was a poster for uh, an event to launch the Rainbow Alliance, which was a, a kind of regroupment project where lots of different left organisations came together uh, and they would have different displays and also activities for the children. And here for the Radical Ecology Conference, 1975... And a kind of interesting uh, obsession with diagrammatic thinking, which, which also comes out of this, this time. Uh, the idea of working out the structure of society and how you can change it. Oh, oh that's it. Sorry. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Emily at all? Man in the lemon <laughs> shirt up the back. Right, yes. Uh, it's, probably, it's probably the only person in this room, and this is not boasting, yes. that's been to all three anti-Vietnam anti moratoriums. Mm. Um, and obviously I'm extremely familiar with all that initial stuff that you talked about because I actually did go to Monash Clayton and... Um, to attend some of the anti-Fraser rallies mm. while I was still at secondary school. Um, I've seen, this is a statement before I ask the question, mm. in my lifetime so far, um, I have seen two heroes, sorry, a hero and a villain swap sides. Milton Fraser was the absolute antichrist. He was the mm. most hated person amongst my peer group. Um, I have seen him mellow and become one of, uh, become a noble humanist. Mm. I never thought I'd see that. I've seen mm. Jermaine Greer go from an absolute icon and hero of the time, turn into a pathetic caricature of yeah. what she once was. Now I realise you didn't know her in her mm. youth, but obviously mm. you grew up in an environment where I imagine your mum mm. would have felt similar to. Uh, how I felt. What does your mum think of Jermaine Greer today? <laughs> <laughs> Which is the only Jermaine Greer that this generation knows, because they don't know the previous mm. one. Mm. Well, uh, I, I'm not sure. I must say, I, don't, I, I haven't, uh, I never asked her. I think um, the female eunuch is full of holes. It is definitely full of holes. And it doesn't, in many ways, make the transition to today. But what really struck me about it is that it is a polemic. So it tries to force through a kind of transformation. So it has this kind of libidinous uh, energy, which I think is really, really interesting. And my thought in using it, even though by this stage Jermaine had was exhibiting some difficult behaviours and comments. Um, 
was really to say that feminism is intergenerational, that uh, that we can that the, the struggle goes on, and it was just a way in, I guess, in a way, and to explore those ideas through materiality. So to use, in a way, different images and materials which we would associate with bad feminist art and thinking. So that kind of idea of the central core imagery and natural materials and a kind of essentialist idea of what women are. Um, that was all in there. But it was really just a way of kind of pushing through and turning around the argument. Mm. So the idea of kind of projecting through a, a future for feminism is not necessarily possible in one work. Mm. Just a, um, apologies, I came in later, but you may have covered it already. Mm. In terms of, um, I'm just fascinated with this relationship of ephemera mm. and, and these finite prints particularly that you're yeah. working with. And, and then the commodity market is what I started to think about. Mm. The relationship with uh, leftist thinking and mm. that relationship as mm. producing commodities and how you negotiate mm. I think that, um, well, one, one thing I have noticed is that artists who are purely left-wing are usually from wealthy families yeah. because to be a contemporary communist, you have to be doing some other thing where you've generated wealth. So I don't really believe in this kind of space of ethical um, communism in terms of raising money. What I do appreciate about printmaking is that it's more about participation. So it's like everyone gets together and does something. Um, and I've been in, involved in some really fantastic projects in that way, including uh, one that Warren put together to, uh, as a benefit for the Museum of Printmaking in, um, in Footscray. So to me it's a little bit of a holiday from the kind of cut and thrust of the art market. Um, I've always had a very problematic relationship to the art market, but um, I need money to live, so I'm totally in it. I accept that I will be in it trying to make money to live. So, um, and that was a decision I made really early. Um, it's always really difficult. Like, for example, if you're a teacher, you're in this space where students are exploited so much. We've got all these fees that you, you have to pay. Um, you've got outcomes that aren't necessarily uh, tangible or ethical. Uh, and your teachers are involved in, in those mechanisms. So it's very difficult to find a space. I don't know how you do it. But if you can ha find a little space for yourself where you feel that you're doing a good thing, then I think that's that's positive mm. Mm. and certainly kind of taking that material from the past and trying to re-examine it uh, whether or not you find a way forward or not I think is, is worthwhile yes so in that light the work that you've shown which is a bit like text piece um, mm. the yeah I really, in some ways, I really turned away from that work. I had this experience of where I was part of the art market and in this kind of commercial gallery, uh, selling work and finding that, that it ended up in this kind of different uh, spaces of commodification. And so I had this kind of smart-ass thing of, I'll just make this work that critiques that. But of course, the ironic critique is a huge part of capitalism so capitalism wants to have this kind of ironic gesture um, and I felt that you just get caught up in it and pulled down into it so in a way the more you engage even as a kind of critique the more you're in it um, and people love that oh yeah I bought this thing and I'm an idiot like, they love it. It's not really a critique. 
So I turned away from that and I felt that it was better to engage with this kind of utopian space, for better or worse. But now I sort of almost feel like it, what maybe what the future is, in a way, is not to imagine a future. So not to have this space where there's this kind of deferred utopia. Um, and there are so many interesting works in contemporary art that are doing that now, that kind of engage with this space of now, we have to do it now. So, yeah. But, I, yeah, I, that's kind of what I was trying to do, but I don't think it was the way to go. Early, early in your uh, introduction, you also mentioned that the conversations you had with your students mm. um, were engaging politically mm. and as a person that's been a sessional in this university and one other university, I've probably come into contact with in excess of 2,000 students yeah. since 2003. And I think I can count the number of strong political opinion conversations I've had. I, can, I think I can think of about 10 mm. in the 10 years. Mm. The great percentage of students I've spoken to are apathetic, mm. are disinterested, or a protective... Don't hold back. No, <laughs> far from holding back. Uh, I'm hoping to actually rile some of the students and yeah. supply some get antagonistic. Um, well, yeah, the, yeah, there are reasons for that. But I suppose... I don't know what those reasons are. Well, I think there's a kind of transition... I think the, the student political student movement is actively d dismantled. So you have people like Costello uh, and Tony Abbott came here as well and actively took it apart, so um, stopped the funding, uh, all sorts of different things, you know, radical actions against left-wing students. Um, then you have things like fees, Ostudy, whatever it was called, not Ostudy, what are the fees called? Hex. Hex. First homeowners scheme so that when you get out you've got to take that chance to get into the home market otherwise you're going to get you're going to miss out all these things you know I think it is true that maybe these guys were privileged in that they could have this voice many of my students don't have time they've got these part-time jobs they don't have this same engagement but it's different it's there it's just different. Political decisions are still made today that will affect their lives and mm. their futures. The amount of political knowledge that I'm seeing on a daily basis is very, very minimal. Mm. Legislation gets through. Very few students know about the effect that legislation is going to have on their lives or even care. Yeah. And our political system is totally poll-driven. Mm. It wouldn't have happened in the 70s or the 80s even but it's slowly snuck into our lifestyle. Yeah. The first thing politicians look for is the headlines, who is going to gain a couple of points in the polls. Mm. This generation, I think, to a great degree, is being driven by that. And I'm just saddened by it, because I would love to see people mm. affected by the things that Costello set up, um, to rebel against it. Yeah. Well, the, I think they're... They're interesting points. I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think you're politically disengaged? By now, in 1975, I would have been burnt at the stake. Yeah, but what happened? It was all a complete failure. It was. So, it was a complete disaster. Yeah, it's a, it's a tragedy. So... Um, that is the tragedy and the failure of the utopia. And uh, maybe people know this and tr are trying to find different voices. I don't know. It's tricky. It's very tricky. It's, it's interesting how the, um, you know, because most of these students are either from a visual communication degree or a fine art degree, but the way the union controls the uh, placement of posters, for example, around mm. the, the union building, which is sort of, uh, you know, I kind of, I, I wasn't a student at Monash in the 70s, but I imagine that it was the university controlling the, the distribution of posters and tearing posters down. Mm. The students now are, are policing, uh, you know, sort of non-union posters that are being put up around campus. 
So I kind of think that, if anything, I feel as though my students in particular should be um, more angered by that. Mm -hmm. that. You know, they're one of the few sort of outlets for for uh, displaying any kind of commentary or. Um, yeah. Well, the campus is really a space of surveillance as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There's. Um, it's not a. It's not a free space. It's under watch all the time. If a poster goes up and it's not right, it can be yeah. taken down. Or yeah. Which even sort of twenty years ago, when I was a student, was quite different. You know, the sort of most the art and design students were either stealing posters or, or putting posters up. <laughs> There is, I don't know, also a really strong movement of, pe of people who, um, in design, who want to, perhaps they've had a kind of straight job, who want to do something different. That's, I see examples of that. Do you agree with that? I don't know. I feel like the body of students that I've had in the last five years are certainly not career focused. I think mm. they're interested in, you know, the crossover with, uh, you know, many different aspects of art and design and mm. film. I don't get a lot of students that come in thinking of it as a pathway or a machine yep. that will spin mm. them out into the design workforce. Um, mm. So I'm kind of surprised that there's not a, a, a more of a political voice as Nettie's as well. Like I, mm. I would sort of imagine that a lot of the students are, are happier just to be more um, less uh, reactive or reactionary. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's a strange kind of environment coming from a, a university environment where, you know, there were sort of protests or um, even just marches, wilderness society or otherwise, in, in, at the university every week. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I've got a not political question. Yeah. When you show a slide of your work and you show us a wide-angle view of a gallery, mm -hmm. and in that gallery there are there is a massive volume of material, mm. steel or timber or whatever, that costs money. Mm. The sheer physical scale of your work, a fine artist might buy a canvas, might spend a couple of hundred dollars on a stretch canvas, mm. a couple of hundred dollars on tubes of paint. They can create their uh, painting and do it easily under a thousand dollars. Your structures, some of the ones I've seen in that slideshow look very, very expensive from the point of view of cost of raw materials, engineering to mm. weld it together, and sheer scale. Yeah. Where does the money come from? Um, a lot of things we make together. So I work with my partner, Eddie. Uh, so we can actually generate a lot of um, material and objects throughout the year. Uh, so a lot of things we make ourselves uh, and some we scavenge for materials and that sort of thing. So although they're monumental, we've kind of set ourselves up so that we can deal with large objects. And originally we did have a separate studio. We were going for this kind of heroic sort of famous artist with a separate studio and it was just <coughs> too expensive. So we do everything in our backyard. Um, so we have these kind of economies and then we can shut it down. If, if it's all gone pear-shaped, we just shut down for a while. Um, but huge things are made in partnership. So in that space, you or I become like an entrepreneur. I'm trying to uh, get money to pay for stuff. Or you do it in partnership. So say with the work with Mama, uh, Mama pays for the production and then I drive it forward uh, and then I get an artist fee which <coughs> I share with my gallery. So that money is there but there's also a lot of, for most of it, the money is raised through selling uh, smaller works, through advanced capitalism basically. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting. You become like a sort of entrepreneur to get to, get to that that space but it's very it is true that you can have an incredible practice not spending money um, and certainly there are artists who I like John Nixon who I incredible I really admire um, who make work with things that are close at hand um, for me this idea of a kind of big gesture comes out of a 
in a way out of a, a feminist space. So I'm really influenced by um, women sculptures, sculptors of the last generation, like Inga King. And in some ways, this kind of this gesture does kind of drive forward this this entry into public space that you can hold it, uh, and it's very difficult to do because it's it's really a kind of male dominated space. So this idea of the the big thing is trying to kind of break into that world in a way. Mm. You done? Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you.